So these words from Mark uh, chapter 2, which serve as the basis for our message tonight. Mark 2 says, a few days later, uh, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. He can, who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier? To say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This is God's Word. So it was 26 years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I was a sophomore in college, which is hard for me to say. 26 years ago, I was a sophomore in college. But uh, at, our, at our college of ministry, we have chapel every morning, and the professors would take turns uh, giving the message for a short devotion. And it was Professor Wentland's turn, and he, he started off by telling us Becky's story. One day, Becky's husband called up Pastor and said, Pastor, I, I don't know what to do with her anymore. Uh, she cries all the time. She never wants to get out of her chair. She, she's afraid to come to church. I'm, Pastor, I'm at my wit's end. Can you come and fix her? That was the way that the husband worded it. Can you come and fix her? And so they made arrangements, and the pastor came over in the next day or two. And he sat across the kitchen table from Becky, and they opened up God's Word, and they, they looked at various passages of comfort and concern. And, you know, the Good Shepherd, Psalm 23, they went through, and they went through passages, I cast all your anxiety on me because... He care, or on, on him because he cares for you. And a, and a whole slew of, of these, these beautiful, comforting passages, and yet nothing seemed to erase the trouble on her face. And she just sat, slouched in her chair, almost paralyzed herself. And finally, the pastor just kind of said, Becky, what is it? And after a pregnant pause, and with tears welling up in her eyes and a quiver on her lip, she started to say, well, Pastor, when I was 15, I got pregnant. And my mom said, well, why don't you get an abortion? And I did. And um, I didn't think much of it. I was young. To be honest, it really doesn't bother me tons, that one. But when I was 18, I got pregnant again. And this time I knew better, and I knew what it all involved. And my conscience was telling me, don't do it. But I ignored that little voice that God had put inside me, and I had another abortion. And pastor, I just don't know how God could love me after I've murdered two babies. At the time that this conversation happened, Becky was 30, so this guilt had been suppressed for 12 years. Why did it surface? Why did it bubble to the top at this moment? Because she had just given birth to another baby boy, a beautiful baby boy, her third, their first. And every time she went to the crib to pick up her beautiful son, she was haunted by the face of the other two or the thought of the other two. 
if you're sitting across the kitchen table from her, what do you say? So her pastor, my professor, said to her, Becky, I, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For years, for years, perhaps, four people looked at this man, paralyzed, and they said, how can we fix him? Right? They looked at his feet, dangling just like ornaments at the end of his legs. Who knows if he was even able to talk? Who knows what was going on inside his heart because the common thought at the time was that if you are paralyzed or if you're suffering from some disease, it is the direct result of some sin. Imagine how crippling that, uh, that could be, you know, how, how guilty that would make you feel. And so they wanted to fix this guy at all costs. They felt sorry for him. They were worried about him. You know, he couldn't do anything for himself. He couldn't bathe himself. He couldn't go to the bathroom by himself. He couldn't, you know, he, the only time he could ever run or walk was in his dreams. And so these four people, we don't know if they're gentlemen. We, sometimes I think in the, the pictures we assume they're gentlemen. But how can we fix him? And they lived in a small town where news got around. It's the same place we've been to the last two weeks, Capernaum. And if you remember what happened over the last two weeks in Capernaum, as we've studied it here in worship, two weeks ago we saw, we saw the amazing thing. We were wowed at Jesus that he, he, he had an exorcism, that he showed his power in casting out spirit in, a, in the synagogue. And then just last week we... We saw him show his power over diseases as he healed Peter's mother-in-law first of a fever, but then he also healed a whole bunch of other people that came to Peter's house. And one by one, they, they all came in. But, but maybe not the whole town got there because the next morning, Jesus escaped and the disciples came after him and said, hey, guess what? People are looking for you. And Jesus said, no, I'm first preacher i got to be a preacher before I'm a paramedic. And he sails across the water. Who knows? Maybe these four guys, maybe this paralytic, were one of those people that morning who said, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? And they missed their chance. But now, Jesus is back. And remember, it's a town where a bird gets around quickly. And so by the time that they hear where Jesus is and they, they bring this guy, you know, the line is out the door. It's a it's longer line than Home Depot was at the beginning of quarantine, right? And, and, and any shouts that they give of, hey, coming through, coming through, falls on deaf ears, maybe literally on deaf ears, as I imagine there were some deaf people waiting to be healed by Jesus. But these guys are like, you know, we missed them the first time. <laughs> And we were so disappointed, and so they are determined not to be deterred again. And so they put their heads together, and they said, all right, how are we going to rectify the situation? What are we going to do? And they, they put their heads together, and they, they said, you know what? They looked at that house, and they, they saw what would have been co somewhat common. There was a staircase on the outside of the house. And they said, ah, the stairs. It was a little bit risky, carrying a a man in a mat up a flight of stairs, right? I mean, you could fall. Maybe it would be dangerous. You could drop him. Uh, and, and yet they, they, you know, they remember what God said, love your neighbor. And, and as far as they remember, there was never a clause on that that said, love your neighbor if it's easy or love your neighbor if it's convenient for you. And so they said, okay, sometimes if you meaning to love your neighbor, it means you have to take a risk. And Jesus never says in, the word, in his word that it's always going to be safe to see Jesus. But they concluded it's better to see Jesus 
no matter how unsafe it is, than not see them at all. And so they said, all right, let's go for it. Let's try it. And you can almost hear them. Like, one, two, three, lift. One, two, three, lift. One, two, three, lift. And they, they get this guy all the way up, probably a, probably a two-story house, uh, typical. And they get up there. Now they've got to navigate the roof, which is historically probably, if you think of like pallets, I mean, not a whole lot of pitch to these roofs. It's a dry, arid country. And so they, they maybe would have had a little pitch, but not a whole bunch of pitch. And so think of like pallets or wood slats up there. And in between the slats, they would have stuffed mortar and sand and dirt and straw. And, and so you're navigating how to walk and, and disperse your weight as the five of you. And, and you're probably putting your, your ear to the ground, trying to, trying to pinpoint where Jesus is below you. You know, can you hear his muffled voice uh, through the roof? And, and when you think you've got it, you start to dig. They unroof the roof. Can you imagine what it would be like to be inside that house when that happens? You know, last Sunday, um, you guys were here on Sunday, but you know, the blood mobile came during, during my sermon, and I should have just called a timeout because 90% of our heads went, yeah. what's going on out there, right? <laughs> well, where do you think their heads went, you know? Uh, I mean, or, or, or think of a picture of what that would be today. So let's say we just heard some tramps tramping around up there and maybe lugging a body, and, and all of a sudden you hear, you know, a little scratching, a little digging. And all of a sudden, these tiles start to come off, right? And the, the little insulation maybe falls on us. I, I don't think your eyes would be here, right? You'd be looking up there. And so were they, I'm sure. As the debris is starting to fall down, and, and all of a sudden, sunlight starts to peer in through this roof. And all of a sudden, you see a shadow. And then you see it's a mat. And, and these guys coordinate it. They carefully maneuver in such a way, dropping the ropes at, a, at an even pace so that, you know, they don't want to make them unlevel and just lower and lower and lower and lower until he lands at the feet of Jesus. When he gets there, I bet you can hear a pin drop. What's he going to say? And this is how Jesus breaks the silence. He says, son, and maybe just pause there. What a title, son. He already gives us a clue that there is a relationship here. Uh, son shows that there's compassion here, right? Son, your sins are forgiven. I'm just going to pause for 10 seconds and ask you to think about a sin or three <laughs> that you are harboring in your heart right now. Some of you just got a head start. You're already thinking of it. I'll give you 10 seconds right now. Did you come up with at least one? Why could you remember? Or why did you remember any of your sins? Because you realize God doesn't. So we heard in Isaiah, God remembers your sins no more. He sends your sins away. He sent your sins to the cross of Jesus. He says to each of you here today, he says, sons, your sins are forgiven. He says, daughters, your sins are forgiven. And, you know, and, and if you're in that Capernaum house that day and you hear Jesus say this, you would expect some maybe spontaneous cheering or maybe a spontaneous golf clap at best or maybe at least a smile or, or some relief that is expressed when you hear these words, son, your sin are, sins are forgiven, and yet it's quite the opposite as there's internal grumbling going on, as they say, who does this guy think he is? 
that he can forgive sins. He's blaspheming is the big fancy term that they use for it. Like, this guy's putting his, himself in the place of God. And Jesus knows this is what's going on in their hearts and in their minds, so he immediately addresses it, and he says, hey, what, what are you thinking about that for? Tell me, what's easier to say? To say, not to do. <laughs> Which is easier? To say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. It's easier to say your sins are forgiven, right? Because you can't see if it actually happens. It's easy for me, or a video in this case tonight, to say, your sins are forgiven. Not to do, but it's easier to say it. But in this case, Jesus gives us both. As he goes on to say, he says, I tell you, and he turns to that, that paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. Wow. Similar to what I said two weeks ago, I would love to eavesdrop on your conversation if that happened here. You know, we have a few people who come in wheelchairs. For Sunday, Pat, I say, Pat, just stand up. Get out of that wheelchair. She walks out. You say, wow. Right? Yeah, you see, once again, you are amazed at God's power, at Jesus' power over, over illnesses, of diseases, of, of, of paralysis in this case, and yet don't let the miracle, don't let the miracle mute the message. Because what does Jesus say? Why did he do this miracle? He tells us here, he says, I'm doing this. Why? Because I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And that's what Jesus wants us to know tonight as well. That he has the authority to forgive sins. Don't forget that. You know, over the last two weeks, over the last five weeks, we've really been amazed at so many things that Jesus has done. We've been amazed that he showed his power over spirits as he cast them out. We've been amazed as he, as he healed the sick, as he, told, you know, he took away the fever and he, and, he, and he made other people you know, healed of diseases. But don't fail to be amazed at this thing that Jesus can do, that he has the authority to forgive sin. I know we know that, but I know we also forget that. You know, I have a, a friend who's a, he's a pastor, but he's a, he serves in a high school, a Christian high school. And every year he interviews his students at the beginning of the year, individually. And he says, tell me, how do you view yourself as a forgiven child of God or as someone who's living by, or if you feel guilty when it comes to your, your life, your spiritual life? And every year, the balance, the scales tilt this way. We carry so much guilt with us. Yes, Jesus has the authority to punish us for our sins. But he also has the authority to forgive us of our sins. You know, I, I think of these lyrics from one of my favorite lyricists, a songwriter. Yaroslav Yada is his name. But he wrote in one of his songs, I tremble as I feel your hand, expecting retribution, yet hear no curse or reprimand, but grace and absolution. With you there is forgiveness, Lord. You speak the sweet, consoling word. And I am sure you love me. You can be sure that Jesus loves you. Whether you're sitting in church or whether you're sitting across someone at a kitchen table. And so sons and daughters and brothers and sisters, I, I as a called servant of Christ, by his authority, forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Amen. Why don't we 